progress. <clears throat> Melissa, do you hear me? I can. Hi, Ralph. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and make you co-host. I'm having a, I don't know what's going on. My internet says unstable, just like me, I guess. <laughs> but I'm going to turn it and uh, make it over to you. I just have one announcement before we get in. I was trying to share my screen, but it would just won't let me. I think we've got another minute here. Good. Okay. I'm going to try once more and then. I can't, I can't. So I haven't shared my screen yet. Oh, go ahead then. I'll just make an announcement. Oh, and that, no okay. big deal. It's it's just a picture, so it's no big it's, deal. It says host disabled participant screen well, share. Well, now, now try. Okay, I'll try it now. Uh, looks like we got something going here. Let's see. All right, great. Oh, uh, desktop one. There we go. Great. Yep, I can see. Okay, I'll put it on the first slide. Perfect. <clears throat> and I'm just going to resume. Yeah, Ralph, do you don't mind if I re hi, by the way, I finally got my video to work. Uh, you don't mind okay. if we record we re record this, do you? Oh, no, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to get a drink oh, of water <laughs> with me. Okay, no worries. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, stop my video. And Nancy, did you get your sound? Yes. Great. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to our fireside chat and welcome Ralph, our special guest speaker. I just have one announcement that I want to make. Um, one of our uh, advocates who has been with us from the beginning, and I'm not trying to try not to choke up, passed away. And his family made a donation so that Ralph could be here and I could be here and we could do this. And I just would like to read the note from his family. We certainly, we certainly appreciate everything he's done for Wolf Advocacy. In fact, uh, Ralph, the family had specifically requested that I ask you to join because he had actually worked with you back in the late 70s and 80s on Isle Royale. Uh, and his name was Mark S. Jeffrey. So uh, Mark, this program is dedicated to Mark S. Jeffrey of Milwaukee, who passed away on October 31st. Although he was not necessarily an activist, Mark had a keen lifelong interest in wolf populations around the country and a special affection for the Isle Royale wolf pack. One of his father's cousins worked on Isle Royale in the 1960s, and there goes my phone, and 70s, reported frequently on the health of the pack and the research being done there. Mark was especially fond of Dr. Rolf Peterson and talking about his camping trips on the island and any wolf news he encountered over the years. The Jeffrey family has included us as a suggested recipient of donations in Mark's memory. So if we can just take one minute to think of Mark, and then Ralph, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you guys. I'm trying not to choke up. <laughs> That's very nice. It's very nice. And he was only 67 years old. So, mm, so not, wow. too, not, not too old. So, All right, Ralph, if you would like to get started, uh, thank you for joining us. I'll let you introduce yourself. I think all of you know who I am, uh, Executive Director of Great Lakes Wildlife Alliance and Friends of the Wisconsin Wolf. Been at this a long time. We're closely with Nancy. Uh, we've worked together, um, uh, Ralph, before and uh, actually at kind of cool, and I can't speak today, uh, canoeing stuff that uh, my dad and I are very interested in. So it's really good to see you again. My guess is it's a little even colder where you are, as opposed to where I am. I woke up and saw snow and just was like, why do I live here? <laughs> but my guess is you're pretty used to it. So I will go ahead and turn things over to you. Um, and then at the end, just a special announcement. So we don't, we can just end and take questions. We do not have a chat next week because of Thanksgiving. So we shuffled things the week after that we will, and we will go over the new Wisconsin Wolf Management Plan and comment period. So thanks everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Ralph. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa. Um... I uh, let's see. Let me back up here. 
Uh, just by way of introduction, I'm uh, retired from Michigan Tech, but they, I can call myself a research professor, and, uh, and that's good enough. <laughs> uh, I don't go to meetings, and I don't take on graduate students, and I don't teach classes, and they don't pay me anything. So that's that's the deal. <clears throat> so uh, the heavy the heavy lifting associated with the the Wolf res research at Isle Royal is. Uh, done by John Dustich and Sarah Hoy. And so I wanna be sure to highlight their, their contribution. And uh, uh, what I thought I'd do tonight is, is do two things. One is just give you an update on uh, what the status of the wolves is, as far as we know it right now. <clears throat> and then uh, tell you a little bit of background on uh, some of the effects of not having wolves on Isle Royal and and how it was that uh, because of the lack of wolves that moose actually destroyed a lake. Uh, I mean, it's kind of bizarre, but I'll give you some details on that. So uh, at the global level, of course, uh, the ultimate cause of the problems at Isle Royal for wolves has been uh, the decline in, in uh, ice bridges to Isle Royal. Um, and that tracks, it's, it's the opposite of close course of global CO2. So it's a basically a climate change uh, phenomenon. And the, the biggest signal, biggest footprint of climate change in this part of the world is shorter winters and uh, warmer winters. So uh, lack of ice is pretty much typical of what we see now, but you know, 50 years ago, we had good solid ice bridges, eight out of 10 years, a hundred years ago, they delivered the US mail by horse and, and dog team across the ice. So it was just, it was a road in the winter. Uh, but temperatures, temperature increased dramatically in the 1920s in this region. And then of course, you've all heard what's happened in the last uh, really 20, 30 years. So that's at the, at the root of a lot of, of the issue of everything I'm talking about tonight. <clears throat> um, if you haven't tracked, uh, the very latest in, in wolf habitat research. Uh, this is an article published in uh, Bioscience Magazine just last month by Bill Ripple and, and about 20 other authors, including John Dustich. And it shows where uh, habitat would be suitable for wolves in the Western states. And as you can see, it's, it's virtually all the federal forests uh, that have forests, the forested parts of the national forests. And uh, so there's room there for quite a few wolves, uh, quite a few more than what we have now. And of course, Colorado is proceeding on a, at the direction of a public referendum last year to introduce wolves in by the end of 2023. So they're moving pretty quickly to do that. And wolves are, are actually introducing themselves into the Northern edge of Colorado as we speak. Uh, going to Isle Royal, uh, this is the last 62 years or so of wolf moose numbers. Uh, the wolves in uh, red and the moose in green. Uh, so there have been some dramatic ups and downs, and I'm just going to deal with the last, the last uh, 10 years or so uh, when the, the moose, the green line was going up very quickly, wolves collapsed. Uh, beginning in about 2012 because of genetic inbreeding. And then after several years of uh, deliberation, the Park Service introduced wolves from the mainland in 2018 and 19. <clears throat> so what we have now is a reconstituted wolf population from that introduction. On the, on the right side is a scale from one to five. Uh, it's moose per square kilometer. Uh, Three moose per square kilometer is a lot of moose. Five is just ridiculous. Uh, at five moose per square kilometer, they're starving to death. And they're, they're eating all the food. And uh, we've seen that in a few places around the world. Uh, and it's pretty much the same. Uh, and that, that is the equivalent of 2,000 or more moose at Isle Royal, which we've seen a couple of times. Uh, for more information on wolves at Iowa, you can go to these uh, these sites at the bottom. Our website, our research website, IowaWorldWolf.org, 
if you think the International Wolf Center's website is wolf.org, just put Isle Royal in front of that and you go to ours. And then Facebook uh, page, we do post things on, on the wolves and moose of Isle Royal as well. Uh, the uh, annual report that came out uh, this year covered everything up through the winter of 2022. Uh, and that's available on that website. And uh, on the cover is uh, a photo of uh, what we call the East Pack or the easternmost wolf pack on the island. And there's some just the more photos of those wolves. Uh, <clears throat> lots of pups, that pack grew from two to 12 in two years. And the intervening year was a, a 2021 and we didn't get to the island because of the uh, COVID pandemic. But uh, obviously the wolves have been, have been pretty busy reproducing. And uh, uh, there was a, a comment uh, the, in, in yellow there, these magnificent animals serve important roles in our Great Lakes ecosystems. And they show us that dedication to family is not unique to humans. And that's a quote by Dana Nessel, the attorney general of Michigan, who incidentally was reelected uh, last week, a week <laughs> recently. So she, along with uh, the governor and the uh, secretary of state all went back in. So some sanity has returned to Michigan. Uh, wolves have uh, their primary effect on moose by killing moose at the two ends of the age spectrum. They kill, uh, they target calves less than a year old. And then otherwise they're, they're pretty much unable to kill moose until they get to be eight or 10 years old with a lot of physical problems that we see in their bones, arthritis and periodontal disease and osteoporosis. Um, so the uh, one thing to watch whenever there's wolf effects on prey involved is what's happening to the young of the year of the prey. And the young of the year for moose have gone way, way down because just since wolves were reintroduced because wolves are killing them. And otherwise in the summertime, wolves live on, on beaver for the most part. So wolf, wolf calves or moose calves and beaver feed the wolves all summer and then uh, Moose adults and calves uh, are the rest of the year through the winter. <clears throat> uh, there are other effects on uh, moose besides wolves. Uh, and the winter tick is a particularly interesting one. Uh, it's a one host parasite. It's a white-tailed deer parasite, basically. And um, what white-tailed deer do is groom themselves and they groom each other and get those ticks off of them. And moose don't do that. Um, they're not accustomed to having ectoparasites on them. And, and they didn't have this problem until moose met white-tailed deer after moose colonized North America about 10,000 years ago. So uh, they encountered deer in, uh, at the southern edge of the ice um, several thousand years ago and picked up a bunch of parasites from deer and the winter tick is one that has persisted <clears throat> and uh, because moose don't seem to groom themselves effectively the way deer do the moose accumulate thousands and thousands of these ticks so either the high record for a moose is a hundred thousand ticks on a on a single moose who was dead uh, so this uh, uh, this particular moose we collared it in uh, February and it had a pretty dramatic uh, hair loss from rubbing itself on trees and biting its own hair to get rid of ticks. And uh, it died of malnutrition, basically starvation on April 6th. So ticks basically explained uh, that mortality along with shortage of food. So food shortage has been an issue for moose in the last few years because they've been existing at a very high level for many years. Um, and they exhausted their food in, in many areas of the winter, of their winter range. So to address the problem of what moose would do on the island to their habitat without wolves, uh, the National Park Service in 2018 finally decided and signed off on a plan to restore wolves to Isle Royal. There were only two native wolves left at that time, uh, and they weren't reproducing. So the Park Service tried to get the most 
genetically diverse bunch of wolves possible. So they brought four in from Minnesota from the Grand Portage uh, Indian Reservation. Uh, and the tribe actually gave those four wolves to the park free and clear. And the tribe did all the work of catching them and, and getting them to basically getting them to the dock to get, get to the island. And then uh, 11 wolves came from Ontario, eight of them from Michipicoten Island. And that's significant because uh, that's a, a big part of the wolf story now that's ongoing is the uh, the high representation of wolves from Mitch Picoten and the genetic stock of Mitch Picoten. And then four wolves from uh, Upper Michigan. Um, let's see, Mitch Picoten, I'll, I won't diverge too, ma too long, but Mitch Picoten uh, was stocked with caribou by the province of Ontario in 1984, I believe, so that there'd be a, a second refuge for caribou, predator free refuge, besides the Slate Islands, which is this little island uh, set of islands right up here, which is very small. And there were several hundred caribou there. And so there were some translocated to Mitch Picotin and they did very well. The hundreds and hundreds of caribou uh, existed on Mitch Picotin and, and then wolves got there. Wolves actually got to the Slate Islands and Mitch Picotin in 2014 when there were ice bridges to both those islands. And then wolves proceeded to, to uh, uh, kill all of all the caribou on Slate Islands, and they were in the process of eliminating the last few on Mitch Picotin. Um, so Ontario rescued oh, 10 or 11 caribou from Mitch Picotin and put them back on the slates. And then they put a half a dozen out on Caribou Island, which is this little speck down here on the, near the border. And then uh, they everybody hoped that uh, the Park Service would take the wolves from Mitchell Bacotin and put them on Isle Royal. And that's a wonderful solution. It was just kind of hard to pull off um, logistically. And, uh, but they got all, almost all of them. So eight, eight wolves were moved from Mitchell Bacotin to Isle Royal, but it was basically one family group, uh, mother and father and all their pups uh, from two or three years. Um, so there's the, the source of some genetic concern. Um, I was real happy to uh, see some black wolves come in uh, with a special effort by a uh, 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 biologist from Ontario. Um, and they were not related to the Mitch Picotin wolves, fortunately. And I was particularly uh, interested in these two. Both of them were, radio you know, all the wolves were radio collared with GPS collars when they came in, but some of those, lots of those collars failed early on. But two wolves that kept uh, kept going in terms of uh, technology were 11F, a big, beautiful female from Mitch Picotin. And then uh, she rounded up a mate, uh, 16M, who was a black wolf that originated on the Canadian uh, mainland. And uh, 11F was not part of the territorial group that formed, uh, which included her brother as an alpha male and a Minnesota female. So they, she was trying to hide out from that territorial West End pack. And so she lived on islands off the West End. But when she went and recruited 16M, uh, she brought him down from the middle of the island and then showed him how to get to the islands, which involved a swim in the middle of the winter, uh, white caps and <laughs> strong winds and everything else. But he, uh, he did it and he followed her out there and they mostly survived on those islands. Uh, but then in 2019, um, uh, he was killed and there was another wolf killed nearby. And I don't know what that wolf's identity was. And, and 11F's never been seen since. So those two wolves disappeared. Uh, where, they, where they lived are these bright green lines in the lower map, uh, 11F and 16M. And uh, this is the middle of the island where 16 was hanging out and 11 went up there and picked him up and then took him back down. And they lived mostly on this little island out here and a little island right there. But uh, the black male was killed right, right here. Um, so that's the fate of most of these little peripheral groups of, that peel off and form packs. But in the upper map, you see the two 
the two powerhouse packs um, at the west end, one of the at the west end, one at the east end. And uh, this east end pack took over right in the footprint of the original wolves. Um, the male, the, there was a male and female left from the original population, and the male was picked up dead on the trail in uh, October 2019, and he died of wounds uh, suffered from other wolves. So basically, the new wolves attacked him and did him in. And as soon as he was gone, a uh, uh, new bunch of wolves ran into this territory and set up shop. And it turns out to be a brother and sister pair from Michipacoten Island. So that's the genetic concern. And they did mate one year and had a bunch of pups, at least five, I think. And so those are closely inbred pups. And then she disappeared. So uh, there was only one year of close inbreeding. But uh, 7M and 12M are brothers. So the, the best they can do to off to outbreed now is, uh, is with cousins. Uh, except that <laughs> this past winter, one of the Michigan males uh, paired up with a, a female from the East End. And they were doing handsomely, uh, hanging out at the extreme east end of the island and probably mated. Uh, but then the east end pack killed the male and uh, the female uh, spent this, this summer just perched out on the outer peripheries of the island, but probably with pups. Uh, but I don't expect that anything will come of that. But there are probably other pairs of wolves that uh, have reproduced uh, perhaps this year and may succeed. So there, I, I think there's room for three packs. Historically, we certainly had that. But we'll see if uh, if a third pack can figure out how to 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 squeeze its way in uh, between these other two packs. Ideally, at least that's what I think they ought to do. <laughs> but they don't uh, they don't take calls, I guess. So um, that's a that's my brief update, and then I, I'd like to concentrate on uh, on the effects of moose on aquatic habitats, which has not been very uh, very well represented in any research, but the, the issue of uh, trophic cascades and the effect of, of wolves on, on terrestrial habitats has gotten a lot of attention, uh, primarily by studies in Yellowstone, uh, which uh, alleged that because of wolves reducing the number of mo uh, elk, pardon me, uh, willow and aspen trees have recovered. And the, the real situation is much more complicated than that, but <clears throat> I'll, I'll just proceed to move on into aquatic habitats because um, the terrestrial one is, is pretty well characterized and you can uh, see all about it on the internet if you're interested. But the idea is that, that uh, wolves uh, have reduced uh, elk density and thereby trees can flourish. But in reality, um, the elk were reduced not just by wolves, but by grizzly bears, which recovered in the 1990s, and uh, uh, cougars, which also recovered on their own in the 1990s, and then by a pretty healthy dose of uh, hunting of cow moose outside the park, particularly right after the wolves were introduced uh, in, in the mid-90s. So the combination of all that predation and hunting reduced the elk herd in Yellowstone to about a third of what it was. And that has allowed some trees to grow under some circumstances. So that's the terrestrial story. But what goes on in the, in the water? And that's kind of more unique to moose uh, because moose, uh, of all the large members of the deer family, moose spend a lot of time in the water, feeding underwater. Um, that, that white thing on that moose is a wart, a dermal papilloma doesn't make much of an impact. That was a radio collared moose. Um, and he died uh, about two months after I took these uh, videos. He was uh, fighting with another, he was facing off with another bull during the rut and he got gored, uh, poked in the stomach by the other bull and he died of peritonitis. But he was uh, very popular in uh, the Washington Creek campground for a couple of weeks. 
But what are, what are moose doing underwater? That's always been the question. How much do they eat? And are they very selective? And it's, it's kind of a big black box because, uh, you know, moose biologists couldn't see what was going on in there for, for the most part. So I, I'll show you a, a unique uh, video that we took in 2004, a long time ago, but nobody's been able to duplicate it since. So it still stands as, as the only real footage of what a moose is doing underwater. Um, and we took it, uh, took the video with a basically a, a remotely operated submersible, little yellow submarine on a long, long extension cord that went to us in the boat. Um, and we just got really, really lucky uh, first time out. And a couple of things worth noting, they, uh, moose appear to be totally unselective. They're eating anything under the water. Um, and they do have their eyes open, but uh, for the most part, they're just chowing down on everything. Uh, the danger for a moose is not from anything under the water. So that's why they're, they're checking things out every, every time they raise their head, because the danger is always from something above the water. So the little yellow submarine right in front of this moose was not a concern at all. You also don't see any bubbles coming out of that moose's mouth. Uh, and moose have a remarkable uh, nose anatomy, which has a lot of muscles and, and tendons and ligaments, which allow them to close their nostrils. All they have to do is think about it and close their nostrils. Now, we cannot do that. We'd have to hold our nose. Um, and that's how we would mimic what a moose is able to do just by its unique anatomy. So we, we sometimes call the moose the underwater hippo because of these aquatic habitats. So what's the effect of all this feeding on moose? Um, we got a, an important uh, uh, case to watch. Um, in the mid uh, 2000s, uh, wolf predation was extremely high. Uh, predation reached the highest level we'd ever seen it. Wolves were killing 20% of the moose every year. And that was largely on the strength of an immigrant who came to Isle Royal in 2007. And his genetics revitalized the wolf population. And he must have introduced some new techniques also because the, these predation rates were just unbelievably high. And it reduced moose for several years down to 500 or, or so. And, We'd never seen it that low for that long. And what happened was um, aquatic habitats were released suddenly from all this herbivory, all this feeding by moose. And uh, so I'll tell you the story of Lake Ojibwe. And uh, Lake Ojibwe is a, is a beaver impoundment. It's been impounded by beavers since the middle 20th century, but it's an old, old body of water. Uh, it's basically a, just a rain catchment, which has been accumulating uh, sediment since uh, roughly 8,000 years ago when the glaciers left. And there's a rich pollen record that gives us details on what Lake Ojibwe has been doing for 8,000 years. Um, and in 2009, these Google Earth pictures show how water shield, which is a floating native uh, plant, native leaf, uh, floating leaf plant would take over all the shallow parts of Lake Ojibwe in the course of a, of a summer. So, um, and that the lower image shows most of the lake is green and that's all water shield. Uh, and that little inset shows what the surface of the, of the water looks like. Uh, Water shield is really a wonderful plant if you're a moose or a beaver, because it's totally edible. It's very high in protein. And so uh, there were three beaver lodges in this lake, which had been doing really well on the strength of aquatic plants. Uh, they were the biggest beaver lodges on the island in 2006. Um, so there was a whole mess of beavers in this lake. And they never had to come out of the water. So that's one reason they were doing so well. They didn't have to come out of the water because of all the aquatic plants in Lake Ojibwe. Uh, and this is what the surface of the lake looked like uh, in the late, say, 2009 or so. 
at the peak of water shield takeover. And this happened in five water bodies on the island, but Lake Ojibwe is the biggest. Uh, well, beaver were just in, in heaven, of course, and moose uh, figured it out over a period of several years. Uh, they realized, oh, this is a pretty nice place to go in the summertime to feed uh, in a safe place where wolves aren't going to bother you, and it's a thermal refuge where you can cool off um, in hot summer days, and it's got wonderful high-protein food in it. So moose were uh, accumulating in pretty high numbers. We saw as many as 15 moose at one time, as many as 30 different moose in one day. Uh, so it was quite a show. Um, and we didn't know where it was all headed. Um, fortunately, there was a, uh, a researcher from uh, Michigan Tech uh, named Brenda Bergman, and she had erected uh, uh, exclosures, moose exclosures, in uh, I think nine different lakes and water bodies to see what the effect of moose herbivory was. And fortunately, she had one of these in Lake Ojibwe. And this is uh, a diver in Lake Ojibwe next to the exclosure. And you can see right away, there's a lot of plants inside that exclosure that moose couldn't get to. And uh, Brenda uh, cleverly uh, divided the, each exclosure in half with some more fencing. And so beaver could get into half of the exclosure, but not moose. And then in the other half of the exclosure, both moose and beaver were excluded. So she could she could uh, tease apart the, the uh, effects of beaver from moose. And she found that moose ate 10 times more aquatic plants than beaver did, even in a high beaver area. So uh, as uh, beavers continued to flourish and as moose took over and found this pond, uh, the extent of moose herbivory became just crazy. Um, and moose uh, severely degraded the lake shore just by walking around in it. And the, the water surface in some of the areas looked like an open sewer. If, if this property had been, if this, this lake had been on your property, I think you would have been arrested <laughs> for water quality violations. Um, and it was clear that the, the amount of water shield was going down every year because of extreme moose uh, feeding. And then something happened which was totally unexpected, uh, which uh, sealed the fate of Lake Ojibwe. Uh, the beaver dam, the big beaver dam that held back the whole lake broke in November, 2017. And the two remaining wolves uh, were right on the scene at the time. And I should point out, because the moose had outcompeted beaver and basically eaten up most of the water shield, the beavers were forced to feed on land, which is something they hadn't had to do for a long, long time. So they were cutting birch trees. And there isn't much to eat around Lake Ojibwe. Uh, so beavers were putting themselves at considerable predation risk to uh, to venture out on land, but that was the only food they had. So the beaver dam breaks, the two wolves uh, remaining on the island were right on the job, right on the scene actually. And I had a remote camera set up which caught uh, both of those native wolves uh, working on taking care of that beaver, those beavers that were left sort of high and dry. So I'll show you, uh, one video clip by a remote camera. This is the male. Um, and once I start him moving, he'll he'll go over to this uh, this uh, bunch of grass and he'll scent mark there. He's the only male on the island, but he's still scent marking. And then, uh, and you can see when he turns that his, his belly is completely stuffed with beaver and he's holding a kit beaver in his mouth that he couldn't swallow. So he, uh, he was pretty busy. And then the female uh, uh, came four minutes later and did the same thing. Her, her stomach was full, but she wasn't holding a beaver in her mouth. <clears throat> so that was the end of the beaver. Uh, any surviving beaver went somewhere else to live. So since 2017, there haven't been any 
beaver in Lake Ojibwe and the lake itself drained and became uh, just a big mud flat. Uh, and we still didn't anticipate what was gonna happen. Um, and, uh, but mind you, the lake has been accumulating organic debris for 8,000 years and uh, wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't ever getting flushed out. So it was this huge sink of uh, soft ooze. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't dare walk in it because you'd get your boots stuck. And moose uh, had trouble as well. So in 2018 and 1920, well, 2018 through 2022, there have been eight moose that got stuck in this muck and died in the lake. So it's kind of a big La Brea or a little, little La Brea tar pit. Uh, this moose uh, took three days to die. Uh, and people were screaming on the internet, can't you do something? Go get a helicopter, pull them out of there. Actually, there's absolutely nothing you could do. If you if you if you wanted to to intervene and and pull that moose out, um, and uh, when the, when the moose died and wolves ate it and we we got the bones from this moose, it turns out he had broken off both of his lower mandibles, so he had he had no ability to feed at all. So he was extremely weak. <clears throat> In fact, all eight of the moose that died this way were either calves less than a year old or very old moose that were were pretty weak. So strong, fit adult moose could power their way through it. So another unanticipated effect. Uh, so that's more or less the story of Lake Ojibwe. And the lake is gone. It is not coming back anytime soon. Um, of course, plants took over the, the drained part of the lake. And those mud flats have now been um, uh, seeded in with herbaceous flora, and this year uh, birch seedlings are pretty abundant on there. You still can't, I can't walk on it. Even this summer, a, a moose died just like this. So it's still very soft and uh, mucky. And moose uh, have learned that it's not a good place to go. The beaver are gone. So Lake Ojibwe, as, as everybody alive has known it, is, is absolutely gone. Uh, the result of too many moose. So um, I'll close with a couple of quotes from uh, Tom Hobbs at Colorado State University, who's been involved in studying the, the uh, response of willow in Yellowstone following uh, wolf introduction. And he's one of the people, the cautionary uh, folks who say, look, uh, wolves haven't totally transformed Yellowstone. There's a lot going on there. And uh, there's a lot of uh, birch or a lot of willow and aspen that have not come back even though he, he admits, does admit it looks a lot better than it used to. But he wrote uh, a couple years ago, predators are so important, uh, their removal has such long lasting effects that it's naive to think you can quickly reverse the effects of their absence by restoration. And then again, uh, another quote uh, from Tom Hobbs, maintaining an intact ecosystem is so much easier than trying to restore it once the pieces have been lost. So um, even though wolves have been restored to Isle Royale, and they will certainly bring moose density down, and they are doing so, uh, and they, we may be in for some surprises there also, but uh, Lake Ojibwe is gone. <laughs> and so um, you can't just reverse all the effects of too many moose by simply putting wolves back. So you can't reverse history, I guess, is the, is the short story. But it still is a is a is a strong case for restoring wolves certainly, and they do have dramatic effects on indirect effects on habitats of their prey. So I'll uh, I'll stop there and uh, try and entertain any questions you might have. Okay, hey, watch out! I'm going to be on. Oops! Thank you so much, Ralph. I'm trying to oh, start my bet. video here. Uh, uh, well, I guess maybe I could start off with one question that uh, 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 it's kind of one of those I know the answer to, but it's really nice to hear a scientist. Uh, sure. Sorry, mine's not going to say it. Why can humans not replicate what large carnivores can do on the landscape? So, for example, we often hear that uh, that hunters can control deer. 
deer populations or trapping of beavers can control things and that that humans are only need to be the large essential apex predator on the landscape what is it i mean besides the fact that you know most hunting seasons have a, have a time what else makes oh um yeah um, human hunters are pretty weak compared to what wolves are able to do um um just in the case of Isle Royal moose, because the, the, the claim has certainly been made that geez, we could just open the island to hunting and take care of the problem. Um, um, human hunters aren't even capable of evaluating moose the way a wolf can. Uh, a lot of wolf evaluation is with their nose. They can certainly smell uh, moose that are vulnerable because of periodontal disease, tooth infections. Uh, we know dogs can can smell cancer, detect cancer in their masters. And I'm sure wolves can do the same with uh, some of these other ailments of moose. So they're, they're able to cull uh, disadvantaged moose out of the population extremely well, um, as well as calves. And of course they're, they're targeting calves constantly. I'm going on my phone too. So that's something that uh, human hunters simply wouldn't do. It's very hard to get hunters to kill juvenile prey uh, okay. with great difficulty some canadian provinces have convinced hunters to kill moose calves because a lot of them are going to die anyway and so it's a it's a compensatory phenomenon but uh, there's a real aversion to killing young very young young <laughs> among hunters um, and of course it's not uh, in many jurisdictions it's not even legal um, so Human hunting is, is pretty uh, incapable of doing anything like what wolves are doing. And then wolves can, and under some circumstances, kill a lot of, lot of prey very quickly. Um, okay, I think about myself. Can you guys hear me okay now? Sorry, my laptop decided to crash yet again in the middle of a meeting. Yep. I'm on my phone now, so hopefully that works a little bit better. Yep, I can um, hear you. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, it looks like Judy has her hand up. Go ahead. Hello. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here with us tonight. This has been a very interesting um, presentation, and uh, <clears throat> I loved it. Um, one of the questions that I had going back through um, as I was listening is, I was wondering how many wolves can Isle Royale actually sustain? Or will the wolves, um, will they ever be overpopulated or will they control their own population at one point? All wolves are regulated on Isle Royale and most, in many other places, uh, most other places I'd say by their food supply. So as a top carnivore, uh, they don't have anybody typically preying on them except humans in, in the modern world. Um, and diseases and parasites, I, I should mention, and they're quite important under some circumstances. But um, uh, so as far as I'm concerned at Iowa, Royal, wolves will never be overpopulated. They may reach very high levels, and they did certainly in about 1980, getting 50 wolves on an island, which put them at a density uh, equivalent to what the highest level in Yellowstone was seen just after the, the introduction there, roughly 90 per, per hundred, per thousand square kilometers. Um, so they, uh, I think what's unknown and what we're anxious to find out is whether this new population of wolves will have the same, will be playing by the same set of rules that the original population did. In other words, will their predation patterns be the same uh, or will they be doing something so different that it, produces, uh, uh, for example, a moose population that is completely flattened. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's possible because these, uh, these wolves are right out of the gate. They're much, much bigger than the original population of wolves. Um, and uh, how big? Well, <laughs> the wolves from Itchpokoten Island, uh, when they were uh, weighed at their peak, uh, by Ontario biologists, uh, they would uh, be hoisted on a hundred pound scale and just just bring it right to the bottom instantly. 
and I think there were some weighed at over 130 pounds, which is about as heavy as a wolf has ever been weighed. And these are the wolves that were brought to Isle Royale. So these are big wolves and they were starving and underweight and they didn't meet the health standards of the park service uh, that they had set for the introduction, but this was a rescue mission essentially. And everybody wanted it to happen. So these underweight starving wolves were dumped on Isle Royale and they all recovered very nicely. And uh, they put on weight again <laughs> and they're reproducing. And so, um, they they may have a different set of rules because because of their size and just because of this unique history of the current moose population. So uh, I'd say fasten your seat belts and hang on. <laughs> Great, thank you, Ralph. Uh, Diane Kane, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, um, I've always heard that moose have very poor eyesight. Is that so? Is that why they end up getting themselves into trouble and muck and that sorts of thing? Oh, their eyesight is uh, nothing like ours. Uh, they have eyes on the sides of their head. They have very little binocular vision like we do. Uh, and they have horizontal pupils. We have round pupils. Cats have round pupils, but moose have horizontal pupils. And that gives them their, their greatest acuity on the, for the horizon, which is important if you're thinking about predators all the time, which moose are. Um, they, uh, they don't have a real fast reaction, uh, you know, when, when they see people, they're looking at you very patiently and standing very still and just trying to figure you out. And, uh, they may walk away, they may run away, but they, it takes them a while to figure out, uh, what they want to do next. They're a big animal and they, they don't move their legs uh without good reason um so they're ex they're exquisitely uh set up to to do what they have to do which is is detect plants and evaluate plants that they need to eat and stay alive by avoiding bears and wolves um i don't think it has anything to do with their uh, getting stuck in the muck uh that was a it was a situation they had never experienced before we do see places where moose fall through the ice and and sometimes get stuck in muddy little creeks. And you can usually power your way through it if you're a moose, except going through the ice is sometimes fatal. Uh, but the unique uh, muck that exists in Lake Ojibwe is something that they probably weren't encountering anywhere else on the island and never seen it in their life. So, uh, So the weak ones in the population, some of them couldn't handle it. Great, thank you. Uh, Carrie Bahiller? On mute, okay, thank you. Um, this is just absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Ralph. This is wonderful information. Um, the legacy of your knowledge of Isle Royale is something that people can't even comprehend in this day and age, and it's just wonderful. So thanks for sharing this with us. Um, I have some questions related to the diseases of the prey of wolves on Isle Royale. I wonder, um, two questions really, are there any deer, on uh, white-tailed deer on Isle Royale and has CWD ever been found in any of the ungulates on Isle Royale? Yeah, those, those are important questions. Uh, no deer, um, even though there was an effort to introduce them in 1915 or so, they didn't last, fortunately. Uh, and, and that's important now because deer have taken over the North Shore of Lake Superior. So th there isn't a, an adjacent moose population left on the mainland. Um, so if anybody gets over to Isle Royal now, it'll be a deer. And so that was one of my important uh, uh, points with the Park Service is that we need wolves on the island as a firewall to protect moose against deer, especially the arrival of deer and brainworm, because brainworm has been uh, devastating to moose in Minnesota. And uh, it's the primary reason that Minnesota has lost most of its moose. And they've stopped moose hunting and, uh, and moose and moose at the southern edge of their range in North America, which is roughly the US Canadian border are suffering because of parasites that are carried by white-tailed deer. 
So deer would be a disaster <laughs> on Isle Royale. And wolves would, if a deer managed to get to Isle Royale alive, and it's almost certain to happen sooner or later, uh, wolves would much rather chase a deer around and they, they go all winter to do it than deal with moose, which are really difficult prey. And CWD, no. Uh, CWD in moose is not known anywhere. Um, on the, certainly not on Isle Royale and not on the adjacent mainland, but moose can get CWD and they do have it in, uh, I think in Colorado and some of the Western populations. That's, a, that's a, such a huge disaster. It's, uh, I can hardly talk about it <laughs> because it would have been avoidable, but we've got it. Okay, uh, Elaine Swanson. Uh, can I be heard now? Are yep. you sure? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rolf. Um, this really is fascinating. Um, I'm just wondering if you, in your opinion, are we doing enough to, um, to educate and engage young people about wolves? Um, are there opportunities for them to have personally exciting experiences witnessing the, the wolves in their natural habitat? Uh, I, I just think that's the most important thing we can do for the future is engaging young people. Well, they are, um, they are growing up with a totally different uh, mindset than their parents and certainly their grandparents. So if you look at uh, attitude surveys of, of people in the United States, uh, anti-wolf uh, feelings uh, are lowest among the youngest. Then they, as, as people get older, their animosity towards wolves increases. Mm -hmm. So uh, regardless of how they're getting it, I think uh, kindergartners uh, um, are, are, getting, are getting educated about wolves. Uh, I mean, you can go to, into a first grade class and they know what regurgitation is. I, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and they don't typically think of wolves as dangerous. Uh, so they're, they are getting that message uh, through a variety of avenues, I think. Uh, and uh, so I, I think, can, can there be more education? Oh, absolutely. You know, wolf education is, is important, but so is education about democracy and treating other people right. And so young students have a, a lot of things they need to learn about. I think they are picking up the message about wolves and they're keenly interested in wolves for sure. Thank you, Ralph. I am just gonna interject with one question uh, that just came in uh, that was on the chat before. Um, sorry guys, my laptop crashed. So I had to move to my phone quickly. So I apologize for that interruption. And Ralph, I don't know if you can't, if you are willing to or able to, uh, can you w tell us what you think of kind of the wolf politics going on, the relisting, <laughs> it's a long answer, <laughs> the li li listing, relisting, kind of what's going on um, in you know the Yellowstone area, Idaho and Montana and you know, I guess the question is, do you think, uh, what do you think of those politics? And do you think that there is, should be a sustainable hunt in, in wolf states? That's a tough one, but I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll let you handle it. <laughs> well, there may, there may be reasons to hunt wolves, uh, but uh, as a, as a sport, it's not a, a, it's not a sport that I would uh, spend a lot of time advocating for. You don't have to hunt wolves. You don't have to so-called recreationally hunt wolves. They do a wonderful job of, of responding to their, their natural limits. And uh, wolves are regulated by food for the most part, as I mentioned. Uh, they're affected tremendously by outbreaks of mange and distemper. Of course, they're poached to a, a great extent in the lake states. Uh, so a wolf that lives to be four or five years old in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and, and Michigan is a pretty savvy wolf. Um, it's been shot at, I'm sure, <laughs> quite a few times. Um, so they're pretty shy. Um, now, having said all that, um, uh, I, I haven't seen a great reason to hunt wolves in any state. 
Uh, Michigan, I would have to say, I, I'm actually kind of proud of because Michigan had the first state wolf management plan ever written by any state in 1997, I think. And they're in the process of revising it now. And I haven't seen how it's going to come out. And I see Wisconsin doing the same. Um, but the principles that Michigan has been espousing in its in its uh, plans to date are, are pretty good. Um, in the West, wow, uh, I'm, I hesitate to, to say much because I'm not in the West, <laughs> but I do know people in the West. And uh, things really went off the rails, I'd say, in the last few years uh, at the state level. Um, and uh, I think maybe there's some sanity returning uh, to the politics of wolf restoration. Uh, and I, again, I'll hold Michigan up as a bright light. I mean, the legislature has been completely renovated. Uh, the leadership at the top of the state has uh, been reelected uh, and they have generally pretty favorable attitudes towards wolves. Um, um, there certainly is, a, is an issue with wolf depredation on livestock. You, you, you can't put up with that. And lethal control for wolves preying on domestic animals, livestock, I should say, is uh, part of any wolf management plan. And it, it has, it might involve more innovative means of uh, dealing with depredation. You can't just pay a, I mean, it doesn't work great to pay a farmer who's lost a valuable uh, livestock individual. It's just not enough. Uh, so there have to be more clever ways of dealing with depredation that wouldn't involve lethal control. But lethal control will certainly be involved. But some, some bright new thoughts on how to incentivize uh, attitudes, uh, positive attitudes, positive actions by farmers uh, that reduce predation uh, would be certainly in order. Um, Um, the, what protects wolves in the Midwest is the forest. Uh, so wolves in upper Michigan have a lot of forest. They live in continuous forest and the exception are the small little places where there is no forest. So wolves in upper Michigan are relatively safe. Uh, Wisconsin has a bigger problem because they have a big eco to and a big edge between forest and non-forest. And they also have, uh, when you step over that edge, uh, a very high density of cows, maybe the highest in the lower 48 states, the highest in the country. Um, so right off the bat, Wisconsin is going to be where the rubber meets the road in terms of dealing with wolves. Um, so uh, you've got a lot on your plate as soon as you try to tackle wolf management at the state level. Uh, but so far, the federal government hasn't been able to unload wolf management back to the states because they can't satisfy the legal requirements of the Endangered Species Act. So that's been uh, tossed out by the courts five times now. I think the most recent was in February 2022, I think, this year. Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is in charge of endangered species management uh, has to come up with a better idea. They, they re the Fish and Wildlife Service rejected what I thought was, a, was a, a positive idea, which would be to not delist wolves, but rather to, to uh, downlist them in Wisconsin and Michigan as threatened, just so then they would match Minnesota. That would allow uh, depredating wolves to be killed by federal agents or state agents uh, assigned to that task. So lethal control would be on the table as a tool that states could use. Still is not a public hunt, that, that's up to the states. But a threatened status would, uh, uh, well, it still would protect wolves from the sport, from so-called sport hunt, but it would allow for lethal control, which uh, would help a bit, I think. So that's a long answer. It's a big, a big issue. 
No, that I thought that was a great answer. I'm going to try turning on my video. Let's see. I don't know if you guys can see me or not. Uh, are there any last questions? We've just got about, about three more minutes left before we all have to go to bed. <laughs> Mike, go ahead. Yeah, Rolf, uh, with uh, Isle Royal as the uh, island effect uh, come into play with the moose at all? Are they over time getting slightly smaller? Yeah, that's actually a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, they did shrink dramatically <clears throat> after they got to Isle Royal early in the 20th century, they shrank measurably uh, by, 19, by the mid-century, by the mid-1950s. They were significantly smaller in size. Uh, and then, uh, and that is an island effect you know, with, with large animals, more than a couple of kilograms on islands without predators and so forth, they typically get smaller. Whereas real small animals, less than two kilograms get bigger. But anyway, um, and the, the, for the big animals, it's lack of predation usually, which causes the prey to get overpopulated and, and grow to a smaller size, which is more adaptive. But then uh, after wolves colonized Isle Royale, they, they reversed that trend in moose sides. So they were starting to creep up through the 50s and 60s and 70s. And then much to our surprise, uh, moose started getting smaller again as the wolf population crashed uh, from inbreeding, you know, in 2010, 2012. Uh, moose uh, shrank dramatically especially the bulls, uh, in a relatively short period of time. In 15 years, uh, they, they really did shrink quite a bit. Uh, and we, we've tracked this using the length of their metatarsal. So we've got lots and lots of information on this. Um, that's one thing that I think would uh, be pretty plastic. So if, if these big new wolves reduce moose density once again and hold them there, um, things should improve nutritionally for moose, and I would expect their size to increase from improved nutrition, and also because bigger is better when you're facing wolves. So, yeah, okay. that's a very good question. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, Ralph, if you don't mind, I think we have, let's see here, one more question from sure. Jerry, and then we'll let you go. Thank you so much for everything that you've done today and your talk. I think when science meets advocacy, we can really make a difference for wolves. So thank you again. Go ahead, Jerry. We'll go with you. Yeah, hi. I am a little disappointed to hear that you, that you believe that on the occasion, it's okay to kill a wolf for, uh, dep uh, for killing it. Uh, yeah, right. Because what I what I really like to see is, uh, I mean, don't you think it's a reasonable ask that if whoever has cattle on on their land, wherever it is, public lands, private lands, that they do that they also take responsibility and really keep an eye on their cattle oh, yeah. you know, and stuff yeah. like that and do everything that they possibly can because there's plenty of research out there that shows that if once you do kill the wolf well then you have another wolf that comes in, so it's like it's defeating the, the purpose and, oh yeah absolutely in, in michigan uh, uh you know there are there are case histories of of uh, depredation permits being granted and breeding females killed and then uh, you know all it does is release reproduction in the remaining wolves and this is well documented so yeah in a perfect world uh, killing wolves lethal control shouldn't be necessary but okay. you've got a uh, yeah, huge uh, industry out there I mean if you look at the west for example cattle are just released onto federal land and and picked up in the fall. I mean, there's absolutely no, no uh, husbandry at all. And you got wolves out there trying to figure things out. So it's a, a depredation management is not an easy uh, thing to figure out. And there's a bunch of non-lethal uh, techniques, the, the flashing lights, the flattery, uh, donkeys, llamas, <laughs> uh, you, uh, dogs, protecting dogs. Uh, I mean, they've figured this out in Europe pretty well, and they did it hundreds of years ago. Um, but do you have any suggestions on how we can talk to the rest, you know, to that public that you're talking about, you know, 
Well, I, I guess it's always try to, it's useful to try and put yourself in their situation. Uh, you've got, in some cases, a small farm uh, with a few head of livestock, uh, you know, the, sometimes raised in their 4-H program. The kids consider them members of the family. And uh, and wolves all of a sudden, for whatever reason, uh, kill something. Or or they can, they, wolves can have non-lethal effects on dairy cows, for example. Uh, I mean, dairy cows are so fragile. Uh, anything that affects their environment. Uh, I mean, you paint the barn walls and you and they, they go off lactating. So, um, I mean, you've, we've, we've invented domestic animals uh, that are really very fragile. <laughs> and then we put wolves in the, in the middle of them and uh, right. it's, it's gonna be a hard one to, to uh, completely knock out, <laughs> excuse me, as a, as a problem. All right. Well, we're going to end there, Stephanie. I'm sorry that you had your hand up. Is Stephanie, is your question very short? Uh, yes, very short. Okay, go ahead. Um, just a quick question about Isle Royale. Um, do you get a lot of visitors there? And then also, do you have a good chance of seeing wolves at the park? Uh, you do not have a good chance of seeing wolves. <clears throat> and these new wolves are quite afraid of people. Um, so if you want to see wolves, uh, I'd say go to Yellowstone. Uh, if you want to see them in the wild. Um, let's see, what was the first part of the question? Oh, is there, are there a lot of visitors? Um, not by the standards of most national parks, but Iowa World does attract a lot of people in July and August. So the campgrounds and trails have a lot of people on them at that time of year. But of course, Iowa World is closed six months of the year, nobody there. And make sure you bring your DEET. <laughs> uh, oh, no, a lot of bugs, or uh, I just wear uh, bug hats. <laughs> I That's hate right. Well, thank you again, Ralph. We're going to let let you go. And again, we all appreciate your information and uh, we hope you stay in touch and we will too. Sure. I think uh, it's okay, Ralph. I will give out uh, your email if people have additional questions they weren't able to ask today. Sure. And take care and stay warm this winter. Great. Thank you. Now. All right. Thank you, everyone. And again, uh, this is just a reminder, uh, not next week, no chat, but the following Thursday, December 1st, we will go over the wolf management plan, uh, tell you the problems and the non-problems, and we will have our scientific advisory board with us uh, so we can make sure that we are advocating for the best available science. Take care, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>